Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> yes, so my name's John Mowbray and I'm a second year PhD student at the um, Edinburgh Napier University. But what I'm going to be talking about just now is some work I did whilst I was at the University of Strathclyde doing my master's degree. Um, and the paper that I'm going to present to you just now, I uh, presented last year at the iCube conference in Aberdeen, which is an international information science conference. And it's called The Impact of Community Grassroots Campaigns and Public Library Closures, a Content Analysis of Local Press Coverage. So what I'm going to be looking at more so than the other speakers we've heard is um, quantitative content analysis of documents. Um, so first of all, I'll give a wee bit of a kind of overview of the context. So I'll talk a bit about um, public library closures to give you a bit of an idea. And then I'll state what my research question was and the aims I was trying to address with the research. I'll talk very briefly about the literature review as well. Um, so maybe just one or two key points that came from that that particularly informed the study. And then I'll outline the research methods that pertain to the document analysis. And then I'll present some findings accompanied by some discussions and a quick conclusion. So in terms of context, um, in 2012, 200 libraries in the UK were closed and that represents roughly 10% of the UK total provision of public library services. Um, and then in the year to the 1st of April 2014, another 493 were either closed, earmarked for closure, or were passed over to the control of community groups. So essentially, these community groups are volunteers, and what councils were doing is they were relinquishing control, so they no longer had to pay for um, the, the library provision in those areas. And it, it all kind of comes about from the, the recession we had, and when the Conservative government came into power in 2010, um, their austerity agenda what, that is ostensibly to reduce the, the financial deficit. One of the ways that they, one of the ways they tried to reduce the deficit was by making quite significant cuts to um, local authority budgets, particularly in England and Wales. So a lot of these local authorities all of a sudden had their budgets squeezed quite significantly, and they had to find savings. And culture and heritage was one of the first places where this happened, so public libraries were right at the top. And this is ongoing. Uh, the reason it's here to the 1st of April 2014 is because that's just before I started the fieldwork, so that was the context then, but it's continued on in a similar trend. And basically what's happened is, is in the local authorities where they proposed closing a significant portion of their, um, their public library service, community groups have set up to try and tackle. So their grassroots campaigns have started and it's just local people who are trying to protect their libraries. And that's what I'm interested in, was using document analysis to find out a bit more about the impact these grassroots community campaigns have had on the, the library closure process. So the question, the overarching question I had was, well, what impact are these grassroots community campaigns having in the closure process? And the particular aims I was trying to address were to explore the scope and nature of the local newspaper coverage, um, to identify the key actors that are represented in this newspaper coverage, and also to determine how the local grassroots campaigns themselves are represented, um, and also how much of their activities, for example, are being covered, their campaign tactics, are these being reported on? And how are they being reported? <coughs> so just briefly, um, I'll talk about some of the literature that was quite interesting. Um, first of all, in terms of regional printed press, so um, local newspapers, like all printed press, the circulation is dwindling quite rapidly, um, but they still play quite a, a a crucial role and in influence in public opinion in local communities, particularly with regard to decisions that um, local uh, local governments make. So the national library campaigns, like Voices for the Library, the Library Campaign, they try and really encourage grassroots community groups to um, to lobby the local media, if you like, uh, to try and highlight their plight so they can um, get that message out to the public and try and garner some public support in their favour and stop the library closures. Um, it's 
quickly, in terms of media theory, there's uh, this idea of agenda setting, something I wanted to find out more about um, through my research, and it was agenda setting is the idea that newspapers or media outlets generally pick stories that they want you to see, um, but maybe ignore other stories. So whatever you see in here is basically what they want you to see in here, so they can really set the agenda. And then framing takes that one step further, so that would be not only do they choose the agenda, but they can also put a spin on the stories. They can maybe they can maybe use selective quoting, or if there's two sides of a debate, they could um, they could be maybe partisan towards one side of that debate and ignore the other one. So there's many ways they can bias it in that sense. So I thought it'd be interesting for this project to find out are lo where local library closures um, part of the agenda of local newspapers, and also was there any evidence of framing? So. The way I did it was by doing a comparative case study um, and I picked two um, regions in England, uh, Newcastle upon Tyne and Lincolnshire. And the sample selection is quite important in comparative case studies and the reason, there was multiple reasons I chose those two areas. First of all was the geography because Newcastle is quite a, it's, it's quite a small um, geographical region and it's because it's a metropolitan borough, it's quite densely populated, whereas in contrast, Lincolnshire's quite um, sparsely populated, it's more rural. It does have a larger population, it's got about three times the population of Newcastle upon time, but it's just it's a different uh, geographical makeup. And again, there's a contrast in terms of deprivation index um, in Newcastle. The, at the time when I carried out the field work, they had double the unemployment rate than was the case in Lincolnshire, and also they got a higher concentration of deprivation. Uh, and then the council makeup. So in uh, Lincolnshire, the Lincolnshire County Council was mostly a, a right leaning council, so right of centre in terms of their politics. Mostly Conservative councillors or independents who were right um, leaning to the right or UKIP councillors. And then in Newcastle, it's almost, it's a Labour majority, it's left-leaning and um, almost entirely made up of Labour councillors in Newcastle uh, Council. And then most importantly was the fact that in 2012, November, um, the Newcastle County, um, City Council said they were going to close 10, or they proposed closing 10 of 18 libraries in order to save money due to the, um, the cuts to their service. And they asked, they, they said, we'll close these libraries unless volunteer groups can come forward and take over the running of them. And it was the same in Lincolnshire. June 2013, they were going to close 32 of their um, provision of 45. So in most of these in Lincolnshire and in Newcastle are in residential areas or they're in remote rural areas. So it's um, really community libraries are talking about closing, not necessarily flagship um, libraries. I, so how did I get, what I did is, um, the first thing I had to do is to find out what the newspapers actually operated in these regions. So um, newspapers in the UK, .co.uk I think it's, it's called if I remember correctly, and it basically lists all of the local newspapers per area. So you just click in the region and it gives you a list of them. So that, and I found out through that there were three in Newcastle upon Tyne and 11 in Lincolnshire. And then I used this online tool, uh, Lexis Library News. So it's a database where you can get all the printed press on there. You sh if you've got an um, institutional login, you should be able to get access to it. So it's got historical newspaper articles, but all the printed press right up until like the current month. Uh, so, so that was useful as well. And what I did is it's a six month analysis from the proposed closure of the libraries in each region to six months on. Originally it was going to be a year, but I didn't have enough time. There, was, there were too many um, articles to, to analyse. Um, uh, oh, yep. So how I did it was, first of all, to answer the first name was the scope of the newspaper coverage. It's just really simple number and frequency of articles um, and the number of words in those articles as well. Um, the way I did it was really simple as well. I basically took all of the articles off of the, the database and I put them onto a Word document and then it was uh, almost like a line by line analysis and then I just set up tables on Excel. Dead simple, but... Um, 
and the same key actors was the second aim and it was to find out what individuals and groups were mentioned, how often were they mentioned in the articles as well. Were they for or against the proposals um, to close libraries and also what was the quotation counts attributed to each of these actors, so how much, um, how many words did they get per quote and were these for or against library closures again. And finally, the treatment of grassroots campaigning for that, I used a, um, a, a coding manual and a coding schedule. So again, it was a line by a line and I'll, I'll, sh I'll talk a wee bit more about that when I show the findings to show you how I, how I did that. So that's just a um, table of the newspaper coverage in Newcastle upon Tyne for the first six months. So November 2012 is when the, the closures, closures were announced and maybe unsurprisingly that's when the most articles about the closures um, came out as well. So there was uh, 35 in that month. Altogether there were 93 articles and there's peaks and troughs there obviously when different... Um, developments happen, there's going to be more in the month. But straight away, just from a quantitative analysis, you can see there that um, in the Newcastle area, it very much was a case of li um, the library closures were on the agenda. Um, there was a significant number of articles. Uh, and then in Lincolnshire, it was broadly similar, 151 articles across the 11 different newspapers. Lincolnshire Echo was by far the most prolific. There was 58 in, um, in that newspaper. These are all quite provincial newspapers, but another thing you can tell just by um, counting the figures, doing the um, quantitative analysis is Boston Standard, for example, they've only got four, but there was two local libraries quite close to where that paper um, is printed that were threatened with closure, so um, the local campaign groups there, just by looking at that, they, they could have done more to lobby their local newspaper to try and get um, and those articles as well. Once I saw that, I went in and had a look at the specific articles. They, weren't, they didn't have much words in them. There wasn't a huge amount of reporting happening, but it's a newspaper with 17,000 circulation, so it could have had um, an impact. Um, so just quickly, uh, I'm gonna, aware that I'm running out of time, so just some other key findings from that as well. Uh, the word count over a six month period in Newcastle upon time was 50,000 and Lincolnshire's 52,000, so significant. Um, in terms of the actors who were in it, so people who were for the closures who tend to be councillors who had been quoted, they were attributed with an evening chronicle in Newcastle, 740 words worth of quotes, whereas um, those against the closures were given three and a half thousand. So if there's any evidence of framing, <coughs> just it would certainly suggest just from doing a number count there that it would be framed in, in favour of the, the um, those who were in favour of trying to keep the libraries open. So it certainly seemed that the newspapers were on the side of the campaigners. Uh, and quickly, the, the coding manual I used to answer or to address the third aim, this is just a, a small a part of it. Um, I had predetermined categories, so one of them was campaign tactics and activities. And what I was doing is I was going through each article line by line and highlighting any cases where activities were either scheduled, uh, men where, wherever they were mentioned, whether they were scheduled, whether these they were talking about stuff that had happened or whether they were talking about things that had been suggested. And it was as simple as that, and everything was attributed codes. I went through each one, and um, and then inputted it into the, the schedule. And so, for example, article number 12 um, had, in terms of campaign tactics, it didn't mention any. Um, in terms of library advocacy, there was two, three, four, and five, so those would each um, match a different... Um, form of advocacy so that could be for example the fact that you can get internet access and libraries are useful if you're looking for jobs those types of things there could be various examples um, but again just from the, the analysis there there was some interesting trends that jumped out for example library professional advocacy there was all, almost none of in any of the art i mean um, the fact that there was two in that article is quite incidental because there was maybe only three or four across all of them. Um, essentially, 
the library campaigners are, are, are trying their best to encourage, um, or the library professionals are trying their best to encourage these groups to really expound how, how well the, the professionals, how useful they are, because if, if libraries get put into the control of community groups, then the professional service is lost. So they really want people to, pre to press this and to talk about the importance of having a professionally run service, but it's not making its way into any of the, the articles. Again, contact details, it shows you there again, there's, there was definitely a lack of them. So they talked about protests, they talked about um, the petitions, but often they wouldn't um, tell you, okay, who's contact details, if who's organising them, or how do you sign the petition? So it's maybe something there that just from looking at the figures, um, the, the campaigners could learn something from. Uh, yeah, and that's just a, a quick breakdown of some of the key findings from that. And um, so professional advocacy in the Evening Chronicle in Newcastle, 7% of the articles had some kind of professional advocacy and 23% in uh, Lincolnshire Echo. And then just some other um, information there as well. So campaign activities were quite well covered in the articles and library advocacy were well covered. Not only were they well covered, but they also had a, a really good range of um, advocacy. So they talked about a number of the benefits of local libraries. So that really came across in the articles. And so just to conclude quickly, um, yeah, so just judging by the, uh, the quantitative analysis, uh, it's clear that local newspapers in these two regions, which, you know, they're, they're quite, um, like I say, I picked them because there was uh, some interesting contrasts within the UK context between them. Um, and they certainly seem to put um, the library closures at the forefront of their agenda. And again, judging purely by the figures, the amount of quotes that they attribute to people who are against the closures, um, they certainly seem to um, frame them in favour of people who are who are um, who are against closing libraries in the local area. And again, the the content analysis showed where maybe um, some of their efforts could be increased in trying to really um, get the press to to advocate for libraries and to advocate particularly for professionals, and maybe to just advertise a bit more what these campaign groups are doing. But um, yep. So and that's me. So thanks very much for listening.